Thanks, everyone. Your Honour, the Honourable Judith Guichon, Lieutenant Governor of British Columbia, Dr. Skip Dick of the Songhees First Nation, the Honourable Scott Fraser, Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation for the Government of British Columbia, Chief Dr. Robert Joseph, Ambassador for Reconciliation Canada and Hereditary Chief of the Gwawainak First Nation, Ms. Deloria Bighorn, Chairperson of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of Canada and member of the Yankton Sioux Tribe, ladies and gentlemen, friends. My name is Jeremy Weber and I'm the Dean of Law at the University of Victoria and on behalf of the University of Victoria, I'd like to welcome you all to this wonderful event. Uh, and we'll begin uh, by first calling upon Dr. Skip Dick of the Songhees First, First Nation to say a few words of welcome to the Territory. Good evening, or hello, something. <laughs> that was by myself. <laughs> My dear friends, relatives, dignitaries, our chiefs, It's so difficult to make sure that we don't forget our chiefs, but we want to make sure that we look after the folks at home, but we want to make sure that we we're correct and right in saying what we have to say. Our, our community, the Lekwungen people, had nine different communities in the Victoria area and were lumped into Songhees and Squamalt and the Saanich Nations. We're part of 53 other communities on the Coast Salish side. But um, somehow or another we're called Coast Salish. But <laughs> that's to be, I guess. My dear friends, my name is Lachichalach, the name that was given to me by my family. Dude, the real good thing is that it ties me to my land and to my family. And I can go anywhere in the world with my name and understand for myself that I belong somewhere, like your names. We need to do that more and more so that no matter how small the world gets, we can go anywhere and know we belong somewhere. The only thing that I need to do is two things. Is thank the university for allowing me to do this. The um, <coughs> reason why I, I really enjoy it is because to me, these words that I, I get to say is is something that was handed down for generations. To me, I'm honoring the old people that give me that little duty. First of all, it was to make sure the, the security of the community, but making sure that all the people that arrived on our shores were looked after, cared for, before you go on your own journey. It's wonderful to see and hear so much happening that should have happened a long time ago. But I'm really, really happy that 
some other things are happening today and that I want to make sure that you all have a really good evening in what's happening. And I wanted to say welcome to our territory, our Lekwangan territory, Aichika. I raise my hand out of respect and thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Skip. I'm always grateful for the graciousness, generosity, and good words with which you start all of our events. It really gets us off to the right, on the right, on the right foot. Heichka, Heichka Siem. Well, this is also an evening of celebration for us. Many of you will have seen the flyers that were handed out as you entered. A little more than two weeks ago, in the provincial budget of February 20th, we learned that a major dream of ours, to offer a joint degree program in Indigenous law and Canadian common law, would be coming to fruition. <laughs> that dream is very much associated with the two speakers that we'll have tonight. Uh, it was very much the vision of Dr. John Burroughs, uh, who will be speaking in a few minutes. Um, it was a part of a joint effort led by John Burroughs and by our other speaker tonight, Dr. Val Napoleon, and indeed Dr. Val Napoleon will be the director of the program. And it's a project on which we've been working for more than 14 years through a long uh, series of plans, pilot projects, workshops, discussions, collaboration with First Nations to see how we could do it and how we could do it right. The essence of the program is to provide over four years rather than three both a high quality education in Canadian common law but also the skills to access, work with, reason with, build institutions drawing upon the legal traditions of Indigenous peoples themselves. So now about 10% of our students are Indigenous. We give them a fabulous background in Canadian common law, but with some exceptions, some important exceptions, we tend to only give them the beginning of an introduction to their own legal traditions. And that means that we, like other law schools, don't provide them as well as we should with the tools to think through how their training in Canadian common law ought to relate to their engagement with their own people's legal traditions. We don't provide them as well as we should with the tools to think through how to build within their communities child protection uh, structures that can protect children within the communities but also respect the patterns of familial responsibility within their peoples or land management practices, land management policies that are grounded in the relationship to the land of that particular people, or structures for the regulation of fisheries and water management, or the exercise of a host of other jurisdictions that Indigenous peoples now possess. This then is a hugely important development, the first of its kind in Canada, indeed the first program in the world to engage with both a non-Indigenous legal system and Indigenous legal traditions with something like equality. It will be crucial in the rebuilding of Indigenous nationhood and in supporting the exercise of Indigenous governments. And we're very grateful for the essential support of the BC government in bringing this program to fruition. We've had the support of many ministers of the Crown, and indeed of MLAs on both sides of the aisle. We've been supported by the Honourable Melanie Mark, Minister of Advanced Education, Skills and Training, the Honourable Carol James, Minister of Finance, 
The Honourable Scott Fraser, Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation, who's with us tonight. The Honourable David Eby, Attorney General of British Columbia. And last, but certainly not least, by the Honourable John Horgan, Premier of British Columbia. We've also had the support of many within the community. The Victoria Foundation and the Sisters of St. Anne are partnering to, partnering to fund the first two years of the inaugural field school in the program, this, which will be beginning this coming semester. And in fact, we only learned about the support of the Sisters of St. Anne this very afternoon. And although a formal announcement will be forthcoming in the near future, Van City has authorized me, us to say that they will be providing substantial multi-year funding to support ongoing community research and engagement with First Nations communities and to further develop knowledge, understanding and applications of Indigenous law within the contemporary Canadian context. And we know that there will be further similar announcements in the weeks to come. Our very great thanks then to our supporters who are allowing us to turn this dream into reality. Our special thanks to the Government of British Columbia. Without their support for the student places, it would not be possible to proceed with the program at this time. And we are proceeding. We received the news a little over two weeks ago. The first admission of students into this program will be happening this coming September. And the response has... And I should say that the response, like yours, has been overwhelming. We'd already reached out to our existing applicants uh, to let them know that we hoped that we would be in a position to proceed with the program this year. Uh, but within the first three days after the announcement of the budget, we had almost 60 more fresh inquiries coming. So we're especially happy to have the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation, the Honourable Scott Fraser, with us this evening, and I'd now like to call upon the Minister to say a few words. Wow. I was an opposition member for 12 years as a, as a uh, critic, spokesperson for the opposition for Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation, the angry guy saying, why isn't the government doing this, that, and the other thing? And, uh, and this is, the time has changed. I, I just, I'm so happy. I have a friend, um, Grand Chief Stuart Phillip of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. Uh, profound, deep words that he always has. And uh, I just want to quote from him, reconciliation isn't for wimps. That's, uh, that's as deep as it gets. <laughs> it is profound. I want to thank uh, Dean Weber. Thank you so much for the introduction. And Dr. Skip Dick, thank you so much for the welcoming that you provided. I deeply appreciate being here tonight. I too would like to acknowledge that we are gathered on the territory of the Lekwungen people, especially the Esquimo and Songhees nations. As a society and as a country, we have a lot to, of work to do to transform the colonial legacy present in the policies and practices of our shared legal system. I, I believe the work is critical if we are to create conditions of justice and equality for Indigenous people, which I am sure we can all agree is so long overdue. I am deeply moved that tonight's focus is to explore the, and contemplate the uh, spiritual dimensions of this work. And this is an aspect of legal knowledge and transformation that this field is ready for. Uh, indeed, I think it's in need of. So many years ago, I learned an important phrase from uh, how is it uh, First Nation uh, Hotwea. Uh, it uh, means hereditary chief, uh, Earl McQuinnett George. I sat with him on the Clackwood Sound Central Region Board, and he taught me a term called Hishukish Sawak. Uh, he took me a year to kind of get that right, and he just kept going, no, no, and then he finally said, yeah, one day, so I was right. It means all things are one, everything is connected. 
Now, the, yeah, that's wisdom. And I, I said that first time in the legislature because I figured legislators, you know, making decisions in a vacuum, not knowing what effect it will have outside of their own little domain, uh, it, it's, a, it's a lesson for legislators. But uh, uh, Hansard had, they texted me right and said, how do you spell that? <laughs> but, uh, they, they, everybody knows the term now. Everybody knows what it means. The teachings have been passed through to the, the Hotwea, that's the hereditary chief's uh, New Kalanath territory where I serve as my constituency, Mid-Island, Pacific Rim. It's just one of the teachings of many from a rich and dynamic peoples uh, that have such deep meaning and application. In the Chalna territory, I am humbled that, uh, at how the Manolf nations have come together in agreement with the province, the treaty, and now, uh, um, now have their hereditary leaders governing their, uh, it's called Hahotri. It's uh, their traditional territories, once again. And many of you will uh, know words for unique indigenous concepts and knowledge within your own language and territories that do, they, they, do, they don't exist in English and French. There's, they, they just don't translate. For example, the word Isaac, it means, uh, uh, it's, it means uh, respect. It's a Nuchalna term. It very broadly means respect, but it also means caring. It means respect and caring, but it's also something much, much deeper than that. It has a meaning that's very profound, and it's not translatable. Uh, like many words and phrases, uh, indigenous language speakers have shared with me, they are teaching, teachings with deeper and expansive meaning, and they're deeply spiritual, and they go right to the identity of a people. The words that exist without singular translation, in many cases, uh, in many languages of, of the BC's uh, peop, First Nations peoples, uh, they provide, it provides important tools of wisdom, uh, as, and uh, we need to respect those. They're essential um, to, uh, as a part of reconciliation. That's why in the uh, budget that uh, Dean Weber just mentioned, last, that we released it last week, our government committed uh, $50 million dollars to help uh, revitalize ind indigenous languages in this province. It's, and nothing like that. <laughs> As uh, in my 13 years almost that I've traveled the province, I've spoken with indigenous peoples from all over the place and I have heard over and over and over again how important language is to the well-being of indigenous peoples and communities, how knowing one's language strengthens the culture and the health of a community, how it helps connect children to their heritage, to their community, most importantly to the land, to the very lands they come from. There is optimism uh, that we are embarking on some real change in British Columbia right now and my optimism is, uh, is as good as it gets right here because there's so many people, so many people here have, uh, have similar feelings about the importance of these issues. We are at a unique point in history, I believe, with the federal government. I think we are strongly aligned, the moons are lined up, uh, and in our commitments, joint commitments to reconciliation and, uh, and recognition, rights, titles, language, and partnerships. I've heard extensively of the hope that this is stirred across the province from indigenous leaders, from all people in British Columbia. But I've also heard of the skepticism and the doubt, which I acknowledge and I understand. And if you look at the past uh, 10 years, past 50 years, past 150 years, if you look at what happened, what's happened last month in recent court decisions in this country, we rec recognize that as a province, there is a long way to go to achieve justice. Part of the way is working with Indigenous people on how to integrate the UN declarations on the rights of Indigenous peoples uh, into, the, into, into things that are actually seen and felt, not just heard, not just words. We're building a reconciliation framework that will do just that. The transformation we're work looking at, for it's, uh, it requires significant investment, and uh, that's what you see in this budget affordable housing, languages, which I've mentioned, child care, mental health and addictions, reducing poverty, improving the access to justice, and revitalizing the environment assessment process, naming just a few. So we budgeted more than $250 million over the next three years, investing in indigenous priorities and reconciliation. In collaboration and consultation with indigenous peoples, we're not doing this in a vacuum. 
An important part of reconciliation is building understanding and respect for indigenous cultures and ways of knowing, exploring the role of the sacred in indigenous law, what this conference is about tonight, as we are uh, as we step forward um, to help and strengthen and understand these concepts. And I want to thank our, our guest speakers, uh, John Burroughs and Val Napoleon, uh, the two key figures in the development of the new joint degree program, uh, Indigenous Law, here at, uh, not here, but at UVic. Uh, and uh, while I want to acknowledge that this program um, was um, um, in part uh, uh, available and, 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 and um, and coming about because of a, a budget decision made by the government. Uh, Dean Weber uh, explained how many other uh, organizations and groups are, uh, are, are, are supportive of this. It's the right time, it really is. While I want to, I, I want to acknowledge uh, John and Val for their tireless work, and I know the future looks bright uh, because of the work you're going to do. This new degree, uh, real, degree will teach a discipline of law never before acknowledged, taught, or affirmed in a school uh, in this way ever. It's truly groundbreaking, the first in the world, as Dean Weber said, and we are honored to be supporting this uh, inspiring call. The int yeah. The intensive study of both Indigenous and non-Indigenous law will allow people to work fluently across both realms. It is vital, a, vitally, a vital part of rebuilding Indigenous law together to meet today's challenge. And I expect many of you here tonight know firsthand how long and difficult the road of self-determination and justice has been for Indigenous peoples in this province, in this country, around the world. And our legal system has been used to make that journey harder, not easier. In 1927, Canada amended the Indian Act to make it illegal to obtain funds for legal counsel uh, or to, uh, if, there, if there was an attempt to try to advance Indigenous title. Up till the 50s, First Nations people were stripped of their Indian status, losing any supports they had and the right to live in their communities on reserve if they became a lawyer or if they obtained a university degree. The 50. This is Canada, ladies and gentlemen. I can't tell you how much I'm looking forward to the day in the not too distant future when new Indigenous law degree graduates enter our judicial system, thanks to uh, John and Val here. I look forward to the day when we see Indigenous law and Indigenous, uh, indigenous law and non-Indigenous law coexist in our legal landscape, and I look forward to the day when all British Columbians can understand the deep meaning of Hishukish Sawak. Slowly but surely we are seeing progress towards recognition and, and, re and reconciliation of Indigenous issues in this province, and I'm very interested to learn more and what we're going to learn tonight, and I can't stay for long, so I'm, uh, I, have, I have friends and colleagues that are staying, for, um, and they will brief me, but we have tremendous Indigenous and non-Indigenous scholars here to share the perspectives of this topic, and it should be an enlightening evening, and I thank you so much for creating the even this evening and the new Indigenous Law School, and most of all, the incoming classes of lawyers who will have help bring about a brighter and more just future for this province and I would think this country too. And I just want to finish, but I was in uh, Prince George uh, two months ago with the Carrier Scanny and uh, Dan George was the moderator and he said, you know we need to, we know what we need to do, we need to affect uh, uh, constructive damage to the status quo. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, you being here all today are doing your part in doing constructive damage to the status quo. And I thank you for that. Well, thanks very much. And now we're about to move into the, the main event. Uh, 
my thanks very much to uh, Minister Fraser and through you, Minister, to the Government of British Columbia for the support. Um, the, uh, this evening is about engaging with the question of the role of the sacred in Indigenous law and in Indigenous reconciliation. Um, and let me introduce to you our uh, two speakers tonight. Uh, to my immediate left is Dr. John Burroughs. He holds the Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Law at the University of Victoria. Uh, he is a member of the Chippewa of the Nawash First Nation in Ontario. Uh, he's Anishinaabe Ojibwe. Uh, he's an extraordinary scholar. Uh, John and I have been colleagues since 2002. I've known of his work for some time before then, but I still learn something new from him, from you, every time you speak or every time I read uh, John's writings. And reading his writings takes a lot of reading because he is an amazingly prolific scholar whose work has been deeply influ influential. He's twice won the Donald Smiley Book Prize for the best book work in the area of political science published in Canada in that year. Uh, this past year, he won the Killam Prize, uh, the single most prominent prize uh, for work in the social sciences. He's been a Pierre Elliott Trudeau Fellow, a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. He's received a National Aboriginal Achievement Award and named Indigenous Peoples Council by the Indigenous Bar Association. Our other speaker is Dr. Val Napoleon. Val Napoleon holds the Law Foundation Chair of Ab in Aboriginal Justice and Governance within the Faculty of Law at the University of Victoria. She's Soto Cree and Deniza from the Soto First Nation in Northeast BC. Um, I, in her 20s, she went to the Skeena and she was adopted into the Gixan House of Luzon, the Ganada Frog Clan, and in fact spent 25 years in the Skeena before coming to the University of Victoria to do her law degree, went on and uh, did the most amazing doctoral dissertation uh, that won the Governor General's gold medal in the year. She taught at the University of Alberta before we enticed her back, and she's such a wonderful scholar. She's a founding director of our Indigenous Law Research Unit, uh, which came out of a project that Val led that was done in partnership with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and with the Indigenous Bar Association. And that had a very substantial impact on the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, especially with respect to the importance of recognizing and taking seriously Indigenous law. And the Indigenous Law Research Unit works intensively with communities to identify resources from within those communities' own legal traditions to address the challenges they face. It's hugely val valuable to communities. The Indigenous Law Research Unit has worked uh, for something like 50 communities, um, and also profoundly illuminating to the rest of us. Uh, uh, in fact, Val's work is something that has provided layers to my understanding and to my respect for Indigenous legal traditions that I would not have encountered otherwise. She too has been named Indigenous Peoples' Council by the Indigenous Bar Association, and this past fall she was inducted into the College of New Scholars, Artists and Scientists of the Royal Society of Canada. So those are our two speakers. Each, each yes. Each will speak for about 20 minutes. Uh, then there will be your opportunity to join the discussion. There will be mics in the audience, so if you have questions, be prepared to ask them. One thing I would ask is no recording and no flash photography, just because that will disturb things, but we are recording. In fact, if you participate in the question session, realize that your questions will be recorded and the answers, so uh, please um, only participate if you're happy with that. Uh, the, uh, and in fact, the, uh, the, the recording, the video recording of this will be available on our website after this session, and indeed it's being live streamed, I understand, right now. So without further ado, John, would you like to begin?
I bring greetings uh, from our territory, which is in Ontario. The screen behind you is going to be showing you some pictures from the Cape Croker Indian Reserve, which is about four hours north of Toronto, five hours north of Detroit on the Bruce Peninsula. And I'm excited to be able to be here and grateful for your attendance and want to express my appreciation and thanksgiving for you being here this evening. I'm also grateful for the wonderful introductions that we've received and the announcements that we're here partially celebrating. This evening, as you know, the topic is the sacred and reconciliation. And one of the points I want to make is that we are going to have a difficult time reconciling ourselves to one another, indigenous and non-indigenous peoples, without reconciling ourselves to the earth. And within ideas of indigenous law are some of the principles that we can turn to to work on that reconciliation with the earth. A lot of indigenous law takes for its principles understandings of the sky, the waters, the rocks, the plants, the animals, and we reason by way of analogy from what we see in the world to try to figure out how to create better human communities. That is, this process of reasoning by way of analogy is something that sees the earth as our textbook, sees the earth as the archive that helps us understand how to resolve dis dis disputes, how to engage in regulation. And in Anishinaabe Moon, we call this akhi no magewin. Our word for earth is akhi, no mage is to point towards and take direction from. And so as we teach Anishinaabe constitutional law at the University of Victoria, the students will have an opportunity to learn about this both in the classroom and by going to these communities. These past four years, I've had the distinct pleasure of taking students to my reserve from McGill Law School, University of Toronto, Osgoode Hall Law School. We've been doing similar work at Walpole Island outside of Windsor and at Chippewa of the Thames, just south of London, Ontario. And what I want to do this evening in my few minutes is describe to you this methodology about Anishinaabe law, our constitutional law, how we are constituted, and what that means for our, again, reconciliation with one another and with the earth. And so as you'll see behind you here, the reserve is located on the Niagara Escarpment. And you have these beautiful escarpments that uh, rise out of the earth, Water, rocks, forest is the setting for our homelands. We, as Anishinaabe people, believe that we came from the sky, um, that children are gifts from the sky. And so when we think about uh, our child and family responsibilities, the kind of work that we need to do, and I see Ted Hughes here this evening and the tremendous work that he's done to help Indigenous families in this province, the work as directed for us as we look to the sky. I'm on sabbatical this year at McGill University, and the students have a pop-up telescope that they take around the town. Once a month, they set it up, and they invite people to come and just look up into the vast expanse. And we were able to go to the top of Mount Royal, and, and on that setting, on the back of that turtle, we talked about the sky, because for Anishinaabe people, our stories are actually chronicled in the sky. The constellations that we see help us remember what our principles are for making judgments, what our standards are for measuring how we should live together. These are our authorities. These are our precedents. Um, these are, again, uh, akin to books. And so as you look across the sky, you see often this uh, Milky Way, as we call it in English, for the Anishinaabe people, that's Chibai Mikana, which is the ghost road. It's the road that we come to this earth on, and it's the road that we travel to as we leave this earth and walk along the path of souls to the land of the dead. Uh, there's a little rattle down there in the corner. We call that Shishikwen. Um, that rattle, when it sounds out, is in remembrance of that burst of light that came from that place and the reverberations that continue to flow through our lives 
and into our language as a result of uh, those sounds that were there in those initial places. So we learn some of our laws from Anango Khan, the sky world that's around us. And no matter where I am in the Northern Hemisphere, when I look up, I see home. And it's a way of keeping connected with these possibilities. As I mentioned, though, our land is, or sorry, our laws also come from the waters. So when I take students to Cape Croker, we spend time talking about the skies. We learn the law. We learn the cases that are part of that uh, realm. We also look to the waters. Um, where Cape Croker is now in Ontario, it used to be 440 million years ago at the equator. At the equator was a warm, shallow sea that's somewhat like you would find around the Great Barrier Reef. And in that warm, shallow sea is where our land formed out of with all of those escarpments that you see that were coral life that ended up building upon one another to get to what we have today. But out of the water is um, the um, kind of more proximate source of life. Um, Anishinaabe people talk about a great turtle that rose out of the depths and uh, all of these divers went to try to find water below the, sorry, earth before the water to be able to bring it up and put it on the turtle's back so that we could bring uh, more health to the life here on this earth. So you'll often hear indigenous peoples, in particular Anishinaabe people, talk about Turtle Island. In other words, the stories that brought us out of the water realm, out of the sky realm, to the earth realm, have messages about how we should be living with one another today. I don't have time to tell you those stories, but when we're in the community, I might take five, six hours just talking about uh, this particular set of stories around Mishi Mekinikon, which is the great turtle island. Um, these rocks that are formed out of the waters, uh, this idea of rocks in Anishinaabemowin, they have stories to tell us as well. Sometimes you see things that look a little bit like figures on the rock. This is um, Chief's Rock that just extends over where my grandmother and grandfather um, raised their family. But in Anishinaabemowin, when you learn Algonquian languages, you learn things that are living and things that are, are not living. And one of the things that's living in Anishinaabemowin are rocks. So imagine the legal implications if the earth is alive. It's not just philosophical, it's actually linguistic. You can't describe what you see here without describing it as a living being. And if you think about the earth being alive, that means you can't just do what you want to the earth without seeking its involvement or its permission. Because to do so would to be to enslave or to ignore the agency of our relatives that, are, that you know, we are a part of as we look at the rocks that surround us. So in thinking about our reconciliation with one another, being contingent on our reconciliation with the earth is partially understanding that the earth around us is a living being, that there's agency and there's opportunities to listen to the earth and there's in the language all the morphemes that have been constructed over 10, 20,000 years that um, help us understand what those forces are telling us. And when you add the language to the stories, and when you add the stories and the language to our observations, our science as it were, we continually find ways to try to understand what the earth is telling us. We also have plants that are a source of our law. This is a little um, strawberry, Ode'imen. The word for heart in Anishinaabemun is Ode, and the word for berry is Min, Ode'imen. Um, this little berry here we, is a part of a, a larger, we call plants mashkike. You've already heard the word for ake, that's earth. Mashkike is the strength of the earth. A plant is the strength of the earth. It's also a word for medicine. When you take medicine into your body, you're taking the strength of the earth into your body. So this is just one example of the many medicines that we have around us. Uh, again, just the very word, Ode'emin. Uh, not only is it a color of red, the color of their heart, and the shape of the heart, but the little root runners that you see around there, if you boil them, are very good heart medicine because of all the vitamins and uh, qualities that are, are found in that. But there's also stories related to Ode'emin, because Ode'emin is a living being, and uh, Ode'emin um, once traveled across that 
path of souls leading to the land of the dead. Um, he was heartbroken because his partner had passed away and he, his longing kept him uh, searching on that path. But when he got to that path, he observed, he watched what was going on on the other side, and then he brought back the message to humans that we should enjoy the life that we're living now, that we don't have to worry that there are other things that are going to follow us once we leave this life, but there's so much that's been given here that we can draw just like kind of the burst of energy that you see in this uh, little heart berry, O De Amin. Um, so as we go on the land, and we offer these courses at UVic. Again, we're going to do this over a four-month period, twice during the student's law degree, so that they get a classroom learning experience, but they'll also be in different Indigenous communities across this country, and they will be learning from these things as they have legal interpreters, elders, law keepers, a band, counselors, chiefs, a folks like myself that will help them see how we can work by way of analogy, from some of these things that are in our presence. We also have animals. When I introduced myself, I said, Nigigan Dodem. I am of the Otter Totem. That is my clan. That is my family. And we have a lot of messages that come to us as a result of being born into a clan. We have responsibilities in our families, and we have responsibilities for specific activities within our community. The Otter Clan is a medicine clan. And as a medicine clan, healing isn't just something that is found in a hospital or a drugstore or thinking around that model. Healing is something that is also emotional and social, and of course law is a social activity, and so healing should also be found in the law as well. And so as we look at the otter, and as we think about our responsibilities in our different uh, family groups, there are things that I will help students understand in relationship to Anishinaabe constitutionalism being built from the messages that we receive and have been passed on to us through the animals. We also have the beauty of our language again that correlates to the earth. This behind us is a river. We call the mouth of a river Sagin, or Zagin. We're actually the Zagin Anishinaabe. We're not really on the Bruce Peninsula, we're on the Sagin Peninsula. And uh, there's a Sagin River um, that flows out at Southampton, Ontario. Um, Zagin. Um, think about if you've ever been in a river mouth, the life and the beauty and the vibrancy that's there. Because what you get is you get all these nutrients that are on the land that are collected by the water in channels and they're delivered in a very focused way to a bay or a lake. And as a result of that delivery and the collection of those nutrients, what occurs is you get probably the most richest and, and abundant variety of life in that space. So you get um, more insects that gather, that can feed on that organic uh, material coming off the land. With the insects that are there in greater numbers, you get more birds that come and uh, find their homes at the, this site. With those insects and those birds, you often find fish that are in greater abundance in that site, which then attracts animals. And so it's one of the places on the territory where you will find that great kind of... Um, um, counseling almost together as animals are living there side by side in different ways. And of course, with the insects and the fish and the birds and the animals, then you get the Anishinaabe. You get humans moving into that site to be able to share the abundance of that uh, rich, rich um, uh, way of living. That's Zagin. And you might have heard of that word in Canada, Mississauga. It's Micha Zagin. It's the, it's the, Micha is the word for big. It's the river mouth. Our word for love is Zagi. If you want to know how to love, you look to a river mouth. What happens at a river mouth is what should happen in the way that we relate to one another. How do we collect all of the influences, the nutrients that flow into our life? and then have them pass through us in a focused way to create the kind of abundance that we see when we look at a river mouth, right? So that we get a variety, we get a sustenance, we get a sense of healthfulness that's in that place because of the way that we're living. This notion of zagin in our language in the river gives you a sense of what goes on when we're trying to communicate our laws about reconciliation, 
because there are patterns in the earth that can be taken into human behavior and made a part of uh, our regulatory regimes, a part of our dispute resolution regimes. The same word is in the sun, zagate. Right? Think about if you lift your face to the sun and the warmth that you receive and how that sun brings so much life and growth and energy and uh, warmth and heat into the world. Um, again, it's related to that idea of love because that's what we want to do. The same goes with uh, plants, zagipaga. Right? When plants burst out, you think of the energy that that takes and how they lift their faces to the sun to be able to receive um, the growth, the energy that's necessary for them to replicate through the ears. Now, what's interesting about that is I've just taken you through a river, um, the light, and the plants. When we signed treaties with the crown, and many people across the country did this, my great-great-grandfather entered into a treaty dealing with 1.5 million acres of land in Ontario. He put his little otter dotum on the treaty. What was our treaty for? For as long as the river flows the sun shines, and the grass grows. That's a statement that sounds nice in English, but when you understand it from an Anishinaabe legal perspective, you understand what our responsibilities are to one another in relationship to reconciliation. It's not just to keep the physical environment um, intact and healthy, although it is that. It's also that we should be like that physical environment. We should be like the river. We should be like the sun. We should be like the plants. And we draw those analogies and try to put them into human terms. So many of our constitutional um, work is found in embedding these principles into our living documents. So you can't read this from where you are, but there's something called the seven grandmother or grandfather teachings. Um, the first one there is uh, Zagidawin. So this is uh, Zagidawin, Dibwewin, Nabuakawin, um, I can't read it, Manajidawin, uh, Zungadewin, Gwakwadizawin, and Dabwizawin. That is, these are our constitutional principles as drawn from the land. They are love, uh, truth, knowledge, respect, strength, honesty, and humility. There's about 40 Anishinaabe communities in Canada that are drafting constitutions. These are the principles that are finding their ways into our preamble. These are the principles that are in our articles. What is our legal, what is our legal aspiration? To live in love, to live with truth, honesty, kindness, respect. Now you might think, how can you embed that in the law? Those seem so ambig ambiguous. They seem so um, hard to be able to define. They are, but so is peace, order, good government, equality, freedom, um, association. Those are hard things to define as well, and yet we built legal systems around those aspirations so that they call us to our better selves. And as we, as Anishinaabe people, put this into our constitutionalism, it's the same kind of thing. We realize that that goal will never quite be reached, but as long as we keep our eyes focused on that, it calls us, like I said, to our better selves. Now, we're living in a time, as was mentioned, of great challenge. There is so much pain. Uh, as you think about the rates of education, the children being taken from Indigenous peoples, the employment statistics that we find ourselves in, the wrongful convictions or the convictions that are not made, uh, the state of our territories with the pollution that surrounds us, we have to have our eyes wide open to all of this upset, harm, and we can't minimize it, we can't sweep it under the carpet, uh, we have to be fully alive to the hurt that is present in our moment that we're living through right now. And that is a part of the work that we need to face as we develop this idea of reconciliation. The world is a messed up place. But the world is also a beautiful place. And as this goes on, you'll also still find laughter and resilience and hope and possibility. That is, beware the danger of a single story. Part of the methodology that we're going to be practicing in this 
degree that's uh, being described is to compare and contrast and to keep our eyes open to the different things that are occurring around us, including even challenging the word sacred. Sometimes the use of that word can be captured by a small group and be used to their own purposes in ways that's kind of shut down conversation. And we don't want to do that. We want to be aware of the danger of a single story. Another notion that I sometimes put out there is nuance is sacred. So with these principles and trying to think about learning about the land, it's not that we're going to find utopia in them. Uh, hopefully it's going to be better rather than worse. But we need to take the in insights and the wisdom from peoples all over the earth to try to find the best possible ways to build these constitutions. This is a preamble there around that constitution because a constitution isn't just a noun. It's a verb. And if you were to learn Anishinaabe Muin, you would learn that 70-80% of her language is verb-based. So imagine thinking about law in that way. It's what we do rather than what we categorize that is the work of law. And it's what we do says to us that law isn't just an idea. Law is a practice. And as a practice, it's a very human endeavor. It's true that we can take messages from other realms and try to interpret them the best that we can. That might be the ultimate source for many of us, and we have different beliefs about what the sacred is. But when it comes into the human community, it's about our deliberation, our persuasion, our listening to one another. It's, this, it's conjunctions, right? It's trying to conjugate life in a way that helps us... Um, open to the possibilities of human form and behavior. And so there's a lot more to say. I look forward to your questions. Um, once uh, Val is finished, I look forward to Val's remarks as well. It's so much a pleasure and privilege to be able to work with both Jeremy and Val. I've long admired Val, and I'm grateful for this time that I've had a few minutes to be able to speak to you. Miigwech bizindueg miyu. Aha. Thank you. Thank you. Well. Right. I'm grateful for the ooh, I'm grateful for the welcome to these lands. I'm grateful to my colleagues and to all of you for taking the time to share with us tonight, um, to share our work as well as this opportunity to celebrate, which is just so superb. Happy International Women's Day. <laughs> so this talk is an experimental fusion of Cree and Gixan beliefs and understandings past, present and future. It's also an exploration of individual and collective legal agency both before and after death and about how our cosmologies fundamentally shape how we see, create, define, and practice law. I'm going to tell you this story now. It's called Cosmology and Law in a Spirit Respite Village. Pain, grief, and fear and then darkness born of violence engulfed Vera. She slowly descended into a sense of nothingness, of emptiness, but all the while she still was. She existed, and in the far distance a slight glow. Was that a path? What happened? Where was she? She felt a longed-for peace, a silence, and around her, she felt faint stirrings, presences. She turned toward the light, moving in its direction, and beside her appeared a striking old woman with her long white hair tied back. She wore a red tracksuit, and, a little surprisingly to Vera, 
hiking boots. Vera recognizes the old woman as Eva, a relative from long ago. As the light turned to day, she followed Eva along a path into a large mountain village. And in the valley and along the mountainsides, Vera saw fantastical dwellings of every kind. And this village was filled with women and girls going about their day, indigenous women and girls, thousands. Through a confusion of great sadness and profound happiness, Vera came to realize that she was in the village of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Wait, wasn't that Irene from long ago? And Pamela lost last year? And there was Elsie, too. Eva explained to a barely comprehending Vera that this village was a safe place for the souls of women and girls to rest while they decided whether to return to Earth as reincarnated beings or whether to stay in the universes beyond. While here and while deciding, they could visit their former worlds as owls, inhabiting owl forms while observing, thinking, and deciding. Suddenly, Vera is deeply weary, needing to retreat from Eva and everyone else. She had to think, she had to watch, figure it out. Her last years had included so much crushing pain and numbness. She stopped believing that she mattered long ago. The points of light and love and hope in her life had grown farther apart and were shorter lived, fleeting. It seemed that what she had lost was her very humanity, causing her to become invisible as a human being to others, mainly men. How did this happen? Vera wants to mourn her losses and the losses of so many others. As Vera sits quietly in the village square with her eyes closed, she becomes aware of presences gathering. She opens her eyes to a circle of women, some old, others achingly young. Vera looks from face to face and then asks, how did this place come to be? Why? I am Debbie, said a very thin young woman sitting to her left, an adolescent really. She said, we created this place about 40 years ago maybe longer now. There were so many of us being killed, so much violence in our deaths, like yours. She reached out to touch Vera's face gently. She continued, we needed a sanctuary, a justice shelter. We still do. This is an international community, and the spirits of women and girls stay as long as they like. Some of us have been here from the beginning. Others go back and are reborn, usually more than once. But why just women and girls, said Vera. An older woman begins to talk. The violence comes from many places. Sometimes our families and our communities are not safe. For others of us, the violence comes from outside our communities, so we have violence from strangers too. And of course, many of our people live in cities now for different reasons. We are students, daughters, workers, grandmothers, sisters, aunties, and mothers. We are everyone. Another woman, young and smart looking, said, We know indigenous men and boys face much of the same oppressive colonial violence as we did. And those experiences must be taken seriously and dealt with on their own terms. As indigenous women and girls, we also faced additional 
often violent sexual oppressions because of our gender. Eva said, some of us are heterosexual or lesbian or transgendered. In fact, we are the whole LGBTQ garden. And we were not perfect in our lives any more than we're perfect now. But we are human and deserving of dignity no matter how imperfect we are. That means that we are also legal agents then and now. We were never just victims. We were citizens and we matter. She moved to sit beside Vera and took her hands and said, You matter, Vera. Throughout your life you made mistakes, but you made decisions as you were able in the very life you had. And sometimes you messed up, but you still matter, and you are and always have been a citizen and a legal agent according to Cree law. Why are you telling me this? Vera asked, and Eva spoke kindly, because it changes how we think of ourselves and each other. In Canada, we're called the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, but we're missing from all over Great Turtle Island and from South America and Australia, too. We are missing and murdered from the world. What if all of the folks in Canada and in the other countries understood us both as legal agents as well as the missing and murdered? And what if they were able to see the conditions of violence that led to us being here now? There's an inquiry going on in Canada. I hope they can learn to see us as legal agents and to see the conditions of violence too. Debbie spoke up. What is new in this century is the level and extent and the relentlessness of the violence done to us. I was a law student, and my professor, John Burroughs, said there was never a time when Indigenous people did not need law. The thing is, our societies were lawful precisely because we have always had to deal with human violence and vulnerabilities. Today, the problem is that while our laws have not gone anywhere, they've been undermined. There are gaps and there are distortions. Where there are gaps in our laws and where Canadian law has failed, these are spaces of lawlessness. And violence happens in these spaces. Mary, who had been quiet and watchful, said, we're free here. We can be anybody and everybody. We can be imperfect, sassy, angry, smart, sexy, troubling, and kick-ass. Nobody is holding us up as sacred, skirt-wearing women or as idealized mothers of various nationalisms. It's the idealizations that create stereotypes of us. And then what happens when we don't live up to them? I think our so-called failures to live up to those abstract stereotypes are just another excuse for the violence against us. Eva chimed in. We are creating new narratives, new stories, and those of us that go back, we'll take them with us. We are using the architecture of the oral histories from our own societies, like the adaptive management stories. Vera. Do you remember the stories you were taught? Not everyone had that benefit, but those stories are tools for thinking, one of the forms of legal precedent for the practice of our laws, and we need them for the rebuilding of our laws and our lawful communities today. Vera, listen carefully. Is there hope? Can we create lawful communities that are safe? Can we really reconcile, like the TRC said? Gertie, with wild gray hair, was standing on the outside of the circle. She snorted. There's always hope, Vera. Pessimism is the worst form of arrogance. But there must be standards for what reconciliation means. How will reconciling be meaningful? 
How will reconciliation change the relations of power? Sheila, who had been listening carefully, spoke up. It's really important that we're completely pragmatic about spirituality and about the sacred. Otherwise, to quote the Dalai Lama, both spirituality and the sacred become red herrings detracting from the hard economic, political, and legal issues before us. And when that happens, spirituality and the sacred can become cop-outs. Jeanette, a a large, smiley woman, spoke up. A society's legal order and law is founded on each society's cosmology. Spirituality cannot help but be a part of every legal system. It must inform the rebuilding of indigenous law as well as any meaningful reconciliation process. But it cannot stop the critical nature of law or the reasoning problem-solving processes, and it cannot be used to hide power imbalances. Hilda added, reconciliation must include and struggle with the conditions of sexual gendered violence, including our deaths. This means that neither indigenous spirituality nor indigenous law can be fundamentalist, but must be open to challenge and to change. Vera was shaking her head. Why do you keep bringing this back to law? Does everything have to be about law? Laughing, Jennifer said, most things are about law. Spirituality, humanity, collective life. We engage with law to be our best selves. Our understanding of ourselves and law are both born of our spirituality. Listen to this quote. Law, in this conception, is the most meaningfully, is most meaningfully operative when it functions in a context in which individual consciousness has striven to understand the reason and purpose for that law and is motivated to follow that law as part of the process of individual spiritual growth and fulfillment. Woo-woo, don't you sound smart now, giggled Gina. Is that Cree philosophy? Well, it could be, answered Jennifer, since it reflects Cree spiritual notions of agency, intellectual responsibility, and law, but it's actually Baha'i. <laughs> well, I'll be, smiled Gina. As the laughter subsided, Vera asked the circle, Have you seen my mum? She must be an owl now, or she's gone back to the world. Mary answered, she's she's on the coast now, and she's fighting for safe, lawful communities, and she's helping to build a first-ever Indigenous law degree program. You should be proud. (laughs) Vera spoke softly. There are so many questions. I'm going to spend some time as an owl and think and watch Do you know that there are owls of every size all over the world? Now I can do some traveling. And that's the story of cosmology and law and a spirit respite village. So there's lots of questions. Here are a couple of themes to add to our discussion tonight. Indigenous law as law. Spirituality or not, indigenous law has to do the unflinching hard work of law including enabling people to deal with complex problems such as gendered sexual violence. It's so easy and seductive to focus on the beauty and the strengths of indigenous peoples and on indigenous spirituality, and in doing so, skip over the uncomfortable conversations about power, about gender, sexuality, authority, and legitimacy. The rebuilding of indigenous law must be community-led, but done at the level of a legal order. For example, there's one Tsimsian legal order, but seven Tsimsian communities. Scale is critical to both law and governance. Number two, indigenous human rights. The best of spirituality and law must include rebuilding indigenous human rights as part of the responsibility of indigenous self-government. 
This includes defining discrimination, articulating who a rights bearer is, and who has legal obligations regarding human rights within specific legal traditions. Scholar Sally Engel Mary asks, how does one come to understand herself in terms of rights, including human rights? She argues that whether one has a rights consciousness derives from one's experience with the legal system where one learns whether her experiences matter to law. In other words, the adoption of oneself as rights defined depends on encounters with the police, with all of the institutions of law. I argue that whether a person understands themselves as human rights bearing in indigenous societies also depends on that person's experience with indigenous law. So think of Vera, Pamela, Elsie, and Eva, all real women. We need to ask, how are our abused women and girls encouraged and supported by indigenous law? What are indigenous definitions of sexual assault and rape? Why don't we know this? What are the historic and present-day legal processes and institutions that deal with gender and sexuality issues? To answer these questions means pushing far beyond the prevailing and often spiritually characterized rhetoric about indigenous women and about law. Dignity and agency are what makes law legal, and as such, they are a, necessi a necessary legality in indigenous legal traditions. Indigenous law, as with any law, are intellectual processes for managing ourselves as societies. Law by declaration, spiritually or otherwise, is only about following rules and about behavior, not thinking and reasoning. Arguably, when law loses its legalities, it's reduced to power and ceases to be law, and we know that all law can fail. So a brief return to the spirit respite village. Hey, Val. Yes, Vera? The interim report on the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls inquiry calls us sacred. Why is that? I guess we need to ask what work the term sacred does. What is evoked by using the language of the sacred? Oh, quit being such a law professor. I mean, shouldn't we not be killed? whether we're sacred or not. I see. Yes, I think you're right, Vera. Thank you. So now you all know why it's such an honor to be these folks' colleagues. It's now your turn to join the conversation. Uh, we have uh, three of our students here from uh, the Faculty of Law at uh, the University of Victoria who will grab the mics and will assist you in uh, asking whatever questions you might have. So is there somebody who has a question who would like to join the conversation? Ah, okay. Wonderful. Hi, my name is Jan. Uh, Jan Sigurdsson. Hello, my name, uh, my name is Jan Sigurdsson, and uh, bo uh, bonjour. Uh, I spent nine and a half years uh, teaching off and on reserve in Northern Ontario, plus a, a very short stint in Inuvik, and I've, I visited some of the First Nations community here in, on the island in the last six years. And um, what comes to my mind is vision. Um, trying to get a vision in the hearts of our children. Of course, you're a, a law school, but I'm hearing the sacred, I'm hearing talks that sound like vision, creating a vision. Um, how do we get that into our children? It's a great question, and part of the question about how we bring this vision to our children is answered itself. 
partially by looking at indigenous law. And so there are stories in Anishinaabe um, society that um, teach us about uh, our responsibilities to children. So what happened in some of the research I've been doing recently is to see that children need to be around us, need to be a part of our lives, um, and I'm, this is not going to sound right, but I, I want to make this uh, clear. When a little child is young, our word for the child is abanoji, which is those who come to you and then hang around. <laughs> <laughs> And, and the, the point is that when children are around us and have this opportunity to absorb by osmosis and question and, and observation the things that we're doing that uh, are in line with our better selves, um, they will then pick those things up and start to use them in their life. And of course, those chains of transmission have been broken uh, by residential school, uh, by the child welfare system, you know that 7% of children in Canada are Indigenous, but 50% uh, of the kids in care nationally are Indigenous. We're finding that those children, when they come to us, aren't able to hang around and hopefully learn some of those good things. Abenoji. Our word for fly is OG. <laughs> um, we need more of this fly on the wall phenomena where children can be present in our homes and in our lives that um, enable them to absorb and to be immersed in some of the things that Val was talking about, the uh, ways of dignity and um, humanity that uh, connects to the respect that we, um, we, we expect to see. And so that's a, a part of an answer. One of the, there's many ways to learn and to teach law, and one of the ways is by, uh, uh, through our behaviors, we can learn about obligations that we have to one another through the way that we see each other being treated, and that's, that's exactly um, part of uh, creating safe communities for kids, is, is to, um, to create those conditions of safety to rebuild lawfulness and safety for all of our kids, uh, including those that, that have been apprehended. And, and it means many things, and it means what, what probably all of you are doing, which is you tell your grandkids stories. And the Giksan have a wonderful saying, it's called, you spit in your grandchild's ear. And what that means is that you you, you get to put them to sleep, and, you, and all the while that you're putting them to sleep, you talk, you tell them the stories, you know, and you keep talking. So there are many, many ways that, that we can act on our responsibilities to, to the young ones in our lives, including they can come and take a law degree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what Val's talking about here is, is customary law, and uh, it's the best law school is homeschooling. Right? Uh, that, that is, if these things can be passed along in that setting, uh, there's a lot that we can do. Hmm. Great. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, this is just a question about the Indigenous law program. Uh, I understand that there's a, a number of Indigenous students now. Um, the new law program, will that be only for Indigenous students, or will it be for non-Indigenous students also? And the students who are not enrolled in the Indigenous law program, are they all going to be required to take some Indigenous law courses? And uh, the, I understand it's 10 students per year. Will the enrollment in the law school increase by 10 students? So these are great questions, and I'll take a part of them. Um, the enrollment per year will be 25 students, which means over four years there'll be 100 students that will be at UVic present in the joint degree program. That increases our enrollment by one quarter. Currently we have approximately 300 students. We'll then be at 400 students. Uh, we expect that the enrollment will be Indigenous and non-Indigenous. 
uh, part of the point of this is to show that indigenous is something, law that is something that can be learned. Of course, it's an advantage if you've grown up in a place and are from a community and have some of those connections already, um, but that's not uh, the, the full um, possibilities. So we want to really show that law is something that can be learned from other people in different parts of the world, and then if they're going to practice that law, um, they will be aware of what the protocols are and the proper standards, and it won't be appropriation, because they'll understand <laughs> that you can only do this if you do it consistent with the procedures that are part of uh, that place. Not sure if you have... So the, the students now in the regular uh, JD program participate in, in a number of different uh, uh, ways of being introduced to Indigenous law. It's like through legal process and through, um, through the regular course offerings. Indigenous law is, is one of the legal perspectives that, um, that's included. And we have been discussing having courses available for both in the JD students as well as for the JID students. And so uh, what we don't want uh, and what would defeat the purpose of you know, building our, our, our skills and abilities to, to work across legal orders is to have two solitudes. And so we're going to be working uh, really hard to make sure that there's that there are connections and working relationships between students in the Indigenous Law Degree Program and uh, in, the, in the JD program. Great. Uh, question here. Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentations. Uh, last night, I read an article in my yesterday arrived Walrus magazine and it tells the story of the Aboriginal people in the Kootenays here that pled their case before the Supreme Court of Canada about a ski resort in the Kootenays that was to be developed on what the Aboriginal people considered sacred mountains. And the case that they were pleading was that their mountains had rights. And it referred to New Zealand, which has given, I, I know at least one river in New Zealand, rights. And the rights of that river are honored, and the Aboriginal people here in British Columbia wanted the rights of those mountains respected because they are in fact sacred. And Beverly McLaughlin, the Chief Justice, in her decision honored this um, idea from the First Nations people, but in the end, as I understand it, said that the Crown superseded those rights, and therefore they were denied. And Michael Moldaver, who's also a, a Supreme Court Justice, was much more favorable to the Aboriginal case and honored their, he used the word religion, and the sacredness of which they believed those mountains had, but in the end succeeded to the decision that the crown superseded that. So I'm wondering if you could speak to this idea of rights and how you talked about the earth and the sky and the water and, and rivers and how important they are and do they in fact have rights and is that going to be incorporated in Indigenous law? Thank you for that question. The case that's being referred to is out of the Kootenai uh, area. Uh, the case is called Tanaka, uh, dealing with Tanaka Nation. And th as was rightly described, there was a proposal for a ski resort uh, near Invermere, British Columbia. And uh, the Shushwap and the Tanaka have a relationship with the mountains on which that ski resort was proposed. Um, through a series of consultations, the Shushwap eventually agreed that it would be okay if that resort would be built because they felt that there was a proper accommodation made through the process of uh, their discussions through the years. But the Tanaka eventually came to the decision that it would not be appropriate to build that ski resort because one of their elders uh, revealed to them that there was a spirit bear that lived in those mountains. 
And if the ski resort was built, that spirit bear would flee, and therefore they would no longer have access to the inspiration, the messages, the understanding, the relationality that comes from having that spirit bear present. And so the court was asked whether or not the minister's decision to develop this ski, uh, to allow the, for the development of the ski resort um, was contrary to Section 2A of the Charter, which protects freedom of religion, and also contrary to Section 35 of the Constitution Act 1982, which recognizes the firm's Aboriginal rights. The court came to the conclusion that there was no violation of the Tanaka's religious freedom in this case. Um, the reason for that conclusion is the court said that under Section 2A, you have a right to believe something, you have a right to manifest that belief, which is to tell others about it and meet together and talk about it and uh, presumably conduct ceremonies and, and worship as it were. So you have a right to believe, you have a right to manifest that belief, but Justice McLaughlin said you do not have a right to protect the object of that belief. So in this case, the spirit bearer would not be protected under Section 2A of our Constitution. Um, and so there's no need for the Crown to have to justify its activity because the belief uh, that, that's manifested can't be protected. The object of this um, um, spiritual way is not protected. So that's the law in Canada right now. Um, that uh, a particular place or a figure is not something that um, will be recognized as uh, having any um, um, shielding or respect in that regard. And um, then under Section 35.1, the court said that um, the Crown had properly consulted with the people there and accommodated them as the best that they could. And Justice Maldiver, who was in uh, dissent partially in this case, said it is true that there is a violation of Section 2A, the right to freedom of religion, uh, because it would be empty to have them perform this ceremony and to believe or manifest their belief if in fact the spirit bear had fled. Right, so the, the, the two judges out of the nine judges said this is a violation of freedom of religion because freedom of religion can't be an empty, hollow uh, protection or promise. Um, and so for the Tanaka, that was good news. But then Justice Maldiver came to the conclusion that in this case, um, the Crown nevertheless justified the infringement on the freedom of religion uh, because of the consultation that had been undertaken. And um, the court and the two judges there said you can't have um, public property being prevented from being developed because of a religious belief of these people. Now, of course, what's left unsaid in this case, which will be a future case, I suppose, is where did the Crown get that property from in the first place? <laughs> the Tanaka never entered into a treaty uh, with the Crown, and so the Crown claims that as a right, but we know from other cases, like the Silcotine case, that it's possible that the Tanaka can persuade the courts that, in courts that indeed this is their land. And so it's a very troubling case in uh, many respects, but I think what the court was worried about was the floodgates, that if you recognize a religious right in this instance, that could potentially tie up development in this province. Now you asked another question. I'm not sure if Val wants to uh, take that on. So I understood the second part of that question was, and will this be taught in the, in the Indigenous Law Degree Program? Certainly, um, along with you know, subst learning substantive uh, Indigenous laws from different legal traditions, part of the work is to look at the relationship between laws. So there's, there's looking at how law from different legal orders will deal with the different kinds of legal questions um, that are part of human life that he, people have to figure out whether it's in the field of you know, land or property or it's in the field of um, 
have different kinds of obligations or, or constitutional law. So there's, there are those substantive areas of Indigenous law, and then there's also looking at what's the relationship between Indigenous peoples, Indigenous laws, and those of Canada, and when might we be able to draw from the legal resources and legal histories of both in order to solve the kinds of um, complicated uh, human issues that, that are the work of law. So, so that's, that's ongoing. That's part of what uh, students in the law degree program will be doing is engaging with that law as, as a way to, to uh, uh, find ways for working together, find ways for you know, horizontal relationships as well as the different kinds of relationships that comprise Canada. And, and in relationship to your question about uh, rivers having legal personality, we'll also be looking to other traditions that exist outside of Canada to see how they deal with those questions. And as you heard in the question, uh, New Zealand now recognizes rivers as having legal personality because of the intervention of Maori law. Uh, Maori people are the indigenous peoples of Aotearoa, New Zealand. And uh, the su system that's been structured is one that allows the river to um, be given its voice as uh, the indigenous language is spoken, as the elders' understandings are brought to what the river might be saying as the stories, as the science is brought to what the river might be saying. Now that might seem unusual to us to think of a mountain or a river as having legal personality. You might say, how can we listen to them or how can we talk to a river? How can we understand a river? That just seems way out there. It so happens though, as we're then thinking about these comparative insights, that we have a category of law that we do this all the time with, which is corporate law. Uh, corporates, corporations <laughs> are, <laughs> are natural persons in our law. They have this status that uh, intervenes in the world. And how do we listen to them? But through uh, boards of directors that give long-term vision for how that uh, corporation is to operate. And then we have uh, officers of that corporation that carry out that day-to-day -day vision. And then you have fiduciary duties and trust responsibilities to ensure that the board of directors or the CEOs are not acting in their own interest as they're trying to put forward what the path of that corporation might be. So you can then reason by way of analogy with me, right? That uh, you could see that similar sorts of systems could be present in relationship to the natural world around us. And we would be using uh, some of the forms that I've just mentioned, but then some of the indigenous forms to be able to help us imagine uh, some of the things I was talking about earlier and how that might live in our legal universe. Uh, up here. Any questions? Up there? Oh, okay. There's one here and then we'll go come back to the book. That's great. Thanks, Clay. Clay. Hello? Thanks, Clay. Um, and thank you both for your talk so much and for the work that you're doing at UVic and that you do in your communities. Um, I had a question that kind of builds on the last one a bit, I think. And it's what do we do in moments when two systems of law conflict with one another? and in moments of imminent crisis. So I'm thinking particularly about the fish farm situation at Swanson Island right now, and the seeming intransigence of the current provincial government to actually deal seriously with the claims by Chief Ernest Alfred that the restocking of the fish farms at Swanson Island poses a serious threat to the wild salmon runs that's going to endanger not just the salmon, but the entire forest ecosystem of the coast. And I'm really just curious, how do we think through that problem? What are our obligations as citizens in moments of imminent crisis like that, where two systems of law just really seem to not be talking the same language? That's one of those really important and very difficult questions that students that come, go through our program, uh, the JD and the JID program, are going to have to struggle with. They're, they're the real problems that are part of the world we live in. Um, I think that um, the, there's the work of law 
is about those very disagreements. We have law because we have those kinds of situations. And so the, the question about what, what laws from the Indigenous side are brought to bear in terms of figuring out a way forward with that conflict or legal problem, and then similarly on the Canadian side, what can be brought forward, and then how might the two together come up with a, a resolution. I guess um, what, I, what I would hope in any kind of process to deal with that very real and, and hard question is that, that the processes through which people work through um, how to, how to resolve the problem and, and creating a different kind of future be as, uh, as uh, engaged as possible, be as uh, uh, intensely democratic as possible so that people are fully involved with the legal life of their, their entire world. And one of the, I think that the, the work of the JID, as well as I think that the challenge for all of us is to um, create a world where, where people, everybody, all people in British Columbia and elsewhere, feel that they have a role in what the law of their country does and in the kinds of decisions that are made so that, um, so that the actual legal processes are, are broadened out rather than becoming uh, more narrow. I still think that as people work through those kinds of hard decisions, there are going to be things that, that not everyone will be happy about on both sides of, of those questions. And I guess uh, what I hope for is that the quality of the process be one which actually improves the kind of world that we live in and how we cooperate together. Um, but it's not going to be a quick fix. It's going to be really hard to get at some of, those, some of those issues. And again, we can reason by way of analogy and looking to other jurisdictions as to how they might work through some of those questions in Norway. There's something called the Finnmark Act, where the Sami uh, work with uh, local populations to make kind of co-management decisions, as it were, and there's dispute resolution structures and procedures as they're trying to persuade one another and negotiate and figure out what the science and the uh, con conflicting interests might be in that instance. In the United States, there's the Pacific Northwest Fisheries Commission, the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. There's one on the Klamath River where um, they're working on these issues using indigenous law as well as uh, federal law to uh, think about questions of jurisdiction, um, conflicts of law, which is a private international law, um, when you, ha you have uh, differences of opinion, can be brought into an indigenous uh, realm. You can have full faith and credit mechanisms. One of my favorite uh, institutions is the Waitangi Tribunal in New Zealand, which is actually a dispute resolution tribunal that operates uh, by juridically in accordance with both uh, the common law and Maori law. So when you um, have a dispute, you have uh, people that will study that dispute from different disciplinary perspectives. It's not just lawyers there, it's historians and anthropologists and elders and community members and all of that information is brought together before a party is actually impaneled. And then when the party um, is impaneled to be able to hear that dispute again, it's not just judges and lawyers that are there as decision makers. Um, the meeting itself often occurs in a Maori marae, which is an equivalent of their big house or their long house. And before the meeting begins, the crown is often met with a haka, where they're challenged uh, in dance form as to what their intentions are in coming to that space. And then there's a waiata, as the crown is welcomed on to the dispute resolution site. And then the people eat together. Feasting is a part of the law because you want to find people talking with one another and building a, a sense of respect and understanding. And it's not just always about distance and the judge 
being blind to everything, but in fact, sometimes judgment is aided if you know more about the people that you're interacting with. And then from that, they sit in the big house or the marae in that case, and there is a panel, and there are lawyers, but elders uh, um, have the opportunity to intervene on that site, that dispute at any point, and there's often community that's gathered just like this, that's listening to the process. When I was there, I was so impressed with it because the recommendations of that process that are then given to the Crown, there's much more information to be able to work through those kinds of uh, issues that you're talking about. And I asked Eddie Jury, who was the, um, the leader of the Waitangi Tribunal, where did you learn about this? He said, well, in the 1970s, I was a young law student and I traveled to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> and at that time, up and down the Mackenzie River was a Berger inquiry. And the Berger inquiry saw dispute resolution happening on the land with indigenous languages and protocol and the Crown going to those sites to try to work through what they were going to do about oil and gas development in that watershed. And then it goes to New Zealand and it takes on that life of its own. We need to get that back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hi, Jane Hoffweber. I have a question about law enforcement. Are there plans to share any of the Indigenous law curriculum with um, the, agents, uh, the institutions that train uh, police officers, like with the Justice Institute of BC or the RCMP training institution? Uh, right at this moment, uh, <laughs> we're, uh, it's early days, of course, but uh, one of the things that, that is going to be really important is that the different institutions that um, are concerned with law and with uh, safety and, and uh, uh, management of our communities, that, that, there's, that, there's, a, that there's a way to connect um, and be inclusive. And there have been um, there have been requests already for workshops and for short courses and so on, and we've actually provided a lot of different kinds of workshops over the years for uh, for different audiences, including uh, members from that are that are working with law enforcement and judiciary, and um, as well as a, a host of other um, uh, institutions and people engaged with different aspects of work. So we don't have anything formal imagined right now, but as, uh, say, if we, if we have, say, for instance, Cree criminal law, uh, indigenous law also had enforcement, or enfor as well as institutions, because all law operates through institutions. And so in thinking about, like, where communities are at and the different kinds of um, arrangements that they have, that's something that communities are already thinking about in terms of how do they go forward with, with uh, taking responsibility or not. Some are more comfortable with, with delegating areas of authority at this point in time. So there will be, I think, because communities are in different places doing different things, there's a vast, vast range of work that people across this country are doing at the local level. So it's you know, some of it is going to, you know, we, we, we'll see how it develops, but it's an important area for Indigenous law and for the communities. So, so part of what this funding that was talked about this evening allows us to do is to hire seven other professors that will be working in the way that we work. And that means that there will be short courses, there will be summer programs, there will be graduate programs, there will be land-based learning. Currently, the work I'm doing in Ontario often does see judges attend uh, those uh, land-based learning experiences. And our own Indigenous law camp here at the University of Victoria Law School was initially started in partnership with the RCMP. And the early years of that program were very much work between uh, that institution and the law school. And there's no reason other than just the capacity uh, that that can't come back again. And that's the kind of capacity that will be built. I have two more questions, and that may be more, as many as we can do. There's one over here, and then there will be one up here. Um, 
I'm in the first year Indigenous Studies program at Camosun, and I was just wondering if I were to like transfer into your program, like what I'd be able to do afterwards, so far as like a job. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> where will it lead me? Yeah, so what do you do when you graduate with this degree? Um, so there's a range of possibilities in that uh, regard. Our students are already in very high demand, uh, obviously to work in the legal profession, but also to work in communities and helping communities along with so many of the issues that we were talking about. Um, policing, child and family development, intellectual property, environmental law, uh, constitutional law, economic development, um, you know, the, the list of human affairs, health law, education law, these are all the kinds of things that we expect will continue to be available to our students, but we think our students will be even more qualified and therefore in higher demand to secure those jobs. Um, we also know that the practice of Indigenous law itself is becoming um, a part of the legal landscape. My own daughter uh, graduated from UVic about a year and a half ago and is practicing with West Coast environmental law. And uh, during her articles, uh, she spent uh, time with the uh, Silcotine people and the Statlium people. And she was basically learning from those people about their law so that their law could be applied to the questions that they have. So how does, uh, for instance, Silcotine law help them with the development of their national park that they're creating and uh, how does Statlium law help them deal with uh, the challenges around their fisheries and their water in that area. Uh, during articling she got to go for two two-week long horse pack trips in the uh, Silcotine Mountains learning how to chainsaw and shoot a rifle. <laughs> so these are the kinds of articling skills uh, our students are going to need. <laughs> And now she's working with the Heltzik on the Central Coast, uh, dealing with oceans law and uh, using Heltzik law to think about the health of their oceans in that area, and then also working with the new Chalnulf in uh, relationship to the Manulf uh, Treaty itself and how that uh, will be implemented. And she's not alone. Uh, there's obviously work that Val's doing through the Indigenous Law Research Unit and other places where community-based practice is going to be increasingly an important uh, part of, of, of finding wisdom and answer to questions. Yeah, our, our students are just snapped up. They, 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 uh, it's really beautiful to see. And the other thing is that we've also had requests from people that already have law degrees calling up and saying, hey, how can I upgrade my law degree here? <laughs> <laughs> Which is pretty amazing. That's really... Uh, People are recognizing the importance of being, you know, having Indigenous law be real as, as doing the work of law and as mattering whether they're talking about land or resources or child welfare or governance or all the things that, that are a part of human lives as we collectively live together. Hey, question up here. Thank you, John and Val, for providing John for the, for the information around the life of nature, including down to the rock. And thank you, Val, for bringing the humanity into the discussion as you tell the story of, of the indigenous women on the other side. I appreciate that. John, I also want you, I just wanted to say that I had a couple of your relatives come and visit my house and they were on, the, on my back porch. They must have been telling me that I was going to come and see you today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Be quenched.